Good evening. I'm Dr. Max Gomez, a senior medical correspondent for CBS News here in New York. Uh, and it is my pleasure again to moderate a webinar, a very important webinar today on childhood obesity, a webinar for pediatricians and families. And I should mention that for the first time now, we are doing a, uh, we have experts from both of the New York Presbyterian campuses, both from the Columbia University Department of Pediatrics as well as the Weill Cornell Medicine Pediatrics. Uh, so we have a, uh, a distinguished bi-campus uh, panel tonight. And there are a couple of things that I should mention here. Uh, later on, you will be able to see the recording of this entire uh, webinar on the Columbia Children's Health YouTube channel. And also later it will also be present on the Wild Cornell Medicine Pediatrics uh, uh, video channel. Uh, we also have a summary document that will be ready for you so you don't have to take notes. It won't be a quiz. Uh, there will be a, uh, a, a summary document produced on all of this uh, that will be out in a week or two. So you'll have an opportunity to refer to some of the uh, more cogent points that we have here. So this is such an important uh, topic tonight because this is weight gain. It's kind of this, not really a silent epidemic, but it's an epidemic that's sort of fallen a little bit between the cracks as we've dealt with the pandemic over the last couple of years. Um, so we're going to talk about what to do about the obesity side of it, as well as the interaction between the pandemic and obesity. And to introduce our distinguished panel, let me introduce John Rausch, uh, who's the Associate Clinical Director for Pediatric Obesity Initiative uh, and the Associate Professor of Pediatrics at the Columbia University Irving Medical Center. John, take it away. Hi, thank you so much, Max. It's great to be here. And I just want to say that I'm, I'm joined by colleagues again from both campuses. So I'm joined by uh, Dr. Jeff Zeitzman and Dr. Rudy Leibel from the Columbia University Irving Medical Center. And I'm joined by Dr. Jane Chang and Dr. Marissa Sansani from the Cornell Weill Medical Center. So we have experts from both sides of our campuses today. Very good. So uh, there is a lot of, <clears throat> I've asked our panelists for permission to refer to them uh, informally by their first name. So uh, I'm not being uh, inform, I'm not being too, what's the word I'm looking for? Anyway, whatever. Uh, we'll, we'll refer to you by your first names. Um, and I think there's a lot of issues here that there's a lot of crossover here. So I'm encouraging our panelists to uh, <clears throat> jump in and add whatever information we can. And I think let's start by defining some of the problem first. And I think probably Marissa, uh, <clears throat> you are probably as good as anybody else here. Uh, let's start first with, can you define the magnitude of the problem here? We hear so much and so many numbers get tossed around including by my colleagues in the media. Uh, that makes it sound really awful, but let's let's talk about what how big is the problem actually? Absolutely, and I wanna thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of this collaborative panel today. It's a great honor. So in regards to the problem itself, um, over the past 30 years, the childhood obesity prevalence has more than tripled. Um, in fact, we know now that pediatric obesity affects over 20% of children and adolescents between the ages of two and 19 in the United States. And in fact, over one third of patients, um, six to 19 years of age, actually meet criteria for overweight and obesity. And in fact, obesity is the most common chronic disease of childhood. So certainly the magnitude um, is great and is really important for us to address these issues um, because of how uh, widespread this issue is. Can you say how much weight on average uh, kids are gaining now? Oh, sure. So that's a really great question. So that actually connects with the, um, the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, the concerns on that on obesity prevalence in childhood. Uh, modeling studies had actually predicted at least a three to 4% weight gain in children during the uh, pandemic. Um, and in fact, in a recent study that was released by the CDC back in September, 2021, what they found was that it was estimated that 22% of children now meet criteria for obesity last August. And that was increased 
from 19% only one year prior. And so in this study, they actually looked into the amount of weight gain that children are gaining. And what they did find was that in healthy weight children, um, those children were gaining on average 3.4 pounds uh, per year prior to the pandemic. And that increased to 5.4 pounds per year during the pandemic. And in fact, children with obesity, what they found was that there was an estimated weight gain of 6.5 uh, previously, before the pandemic, 6.5 pounds per year, and that increased to 12 pounds per year, so almost doubling oh. during the pandemic. And they found that children with severe obesity actually had an increase from about 8.8 .8 pounds per year to 14.6 uh, .6 pounds per year. So certainly that increase was quite striking during, during the pandemic. And there's a number of factors that I think are, are related to that, certainly. So it sounds like once, once they uh, cross the finish line, as it were, started really becoming overweight and obese, the problem just accelerated. Jane, tell us about, we mentioned uh, how about the pandemic. How has the pandemic contributed to this and made matters actually worse here in terms of their eating behaviors, physical activity, and so forth? Absolutely. Um, the pandemic has really magnified the existing problem that Marissa so nicely outlined. Um, it was really the perfect storm of um, the situation that everyone listening in and on the panel is well aware with the pandemic, with the stay at home orders and quarantining, every area that we have been counseling on was affected. So physical activity, um, kids, you know, everyone was staying at home, physical activity greatly decreased, everyone became much more sedentary. Um, even kids that were not particularly physically active before, they weren't even getting the little bit that they were, you know, even if they were just getting gym in school or walking to and from school, going up and down the subway stairs, you know, that was um, completely eliminated. Um, screen time use as um, anyone who's a parent, you know, just completely soared my kids, um, you know, it's like, when were they not on a screen? So screen time use went up. Um, from a eating perspective, um, you know, a lot more access, everyone being at home, access to snacking throughout the day, whereas kids were typically in school and had breakfast and lunch, but they had, you know, access to the to the pantry, to the um, kitchen. I, my daughter was baking all the time. So, you know, as a way to, you know, mm -hmm. fill the time. Um, and then from an emotional perspective, um, many families dealt with a lot of, um, most families, a lot of stress, a lot of anxiety, which contributed to the emotional eating that we that I've seen so much in my adolescent medicine practice. And then from a financial perspective, also um, families were dealing with job loss and facing food insecurity issues that they may not have had prior to the pandemic. And they were turning to foods that were less, less healthy and, and cheaper options as a way to feed their family. So all of these things um, contributed to, so I've seen families, um, patients who have, um, who were previously overweight um, gain a lot more and also um, children and adolescents who were previously normal weight um, now struggling with obesity and, and new to the um, obesity counseling that we do. So it sounds like every little element that contributed to weight gain and obesity just got worse and co contributed even more during, during the pandemic. John, uh, you know, when I visited um, schools and things and, and done some work with uh, the Partnership for After School uh, Education and so forth, it seemed that there was so much there was so much obesity amongst the children and, and their peers um, that I wouldn't think there'd be that much stigma. But is there stigma that's associated here with with the weight gain and obesity in, in particularly adolescents, I guess? Absolutely. And it's not just unfortunate adolescents. We know that stigma starts really early. Stigma starts as early as preschool. Um, kids are starting to recognize these weight changes and to treat their peers differently and to think that they're not quite as smart, not as bright, not as able. Um, and we know that this just continues from preschool up through um, childhood into early adulthood. And unfortunately, we know those kids that are stigmatized are more likely to be victims of, of later stigmatization. So it, it breeds more stigma, stigma as you go on. And these, these have lifelong um, impacts. We know that children with stigma are less likely to phys be physically active. They're more likely uh, to eat the foods that create obesity. Um, they're more likely to engage in risky eating behaviors, uh, which actually can lead to um, eating disorders. 
Uh, we know that they're less likely to see the doctor because the doctor can actually be one of the major sources of stigma out there. Um, and we, we think as pediatricians that we are, you know, a haven um, for our kids, but actually one of the biggest sources of, of weight stigma is the pediatrician's office and the family. Um, so it's not just at school, it's, it's at home and it's at the pediatrician's office as well. So, um, and, and by doing all of these things, we keep our kids out of our office and we actually promote more weight gain. So it is a very significant problem. So kids know that when they're going or feel that when they're going to the pediatrician, they're, they're just going to be more stigmatized or more embarrassed because they're going to have their weight gain, their obesity pointed out to them, and mm -hmm. they're going to have to talk about what can we do about it, and they're just going to feel bad about themselves? Absolutely, and there's a, there's a way that you can talk about it with the language. Um, absolutely, kids already know when, they're, when, they, when they have overweight or obesity that they're suffering from that. Um, no one needs to tell them that. Most of them really do know um, at this point, and um, and if you give them a voice and, and you are respectful, um, it can be very different than if you're just being, um, you know, just dictating changes to them or things that they probably already tried before and, and not recognizing all of the inherent, which we'll hear, I'm sure about a little bit later, the science and the uh, metabolic set points and everything else that is, that is occurring with obesity. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to get to that. And now, uh, Rudy and, and Jeff, um, I, I don't want to leave you out of this uh, at all. I want to talk a little bit about we talk about what the problem is. Uh, and, and Rudy, I think, you know, what all of us sort of hear all the time is diet and exercise, diet and exercise. That's what it's going to take to fix this problem. Um, but some of these kids or many of these kids uh, have the, uh, have the, they're, they're already at a disadvantage because of genetic issues. Tell me about that. We know from studies now <clears throat> conducted over the past couple of decades that there's very strong contribution of genes to risk of becoming obese. Actually, the initial insights in this regard were done by comparing the concordance rates for identical and dizygous or non-identical same-sex twins and the correlation coefficients between identical twins for body composition or adiposity <clears throat> are much higher than those of dizygous twins who are in relationship to each other as normal siblings who've been incubated, so to speak, at the same, at the same time. And if you do some pretty simple math on this kind of analysis, you come up with an estimate that the genetic underpinnings of body weight or obesity are somewhere in the neighborhood of 40 or 50 percent. So the right way to say this is that 40 to 50 percent of the risk of becoming obese in a specific environment is about 40 or 50 percent. Now, there are some environments in which the risk is much lower, meaning when there's mm -hmm. less food available and others where it's much higher, such as those that were just described, our normal environment, modern environment, plus locking people up at home under circumstances of a epidemic, you're gonna see the consequences of the genes interacting with the environment. And that's the critical thing to remember here. I can say more about the genes at some point, but from high altitude, the thing to remember is these genes don't act alone. They act in relationship or in reaction to the environment. And you can set the environment in a variety of ways to make it more or less likely that an individual will become obese. And you can also influence the severity of the obesity. And what you just heard actually is a recitation of a perfect storm for obesity, which is genetic predisposition and a environment. Maybe <laughs> mute yourself for a moment there. There you go. And I'm sorry. To, Say that again, Rudy. Yeah, what I was saying is that recently we've had what might be described as a perfect storm for even further degrees of obesity by virtue of whatever the genetic predispositions are now being exposed to an environment in which physical activity is restricted 
and the types of food and the amounts of food are increased. It's no surprise actually that there's been an uptick or something even more severe than that under the present circumstances. And it's an experiment I don't think any of us wanted to see, but it really bespeaks the interaction of genes and environment in a way which uh, I think is, is very striking. So I don't, want to, I don't want people to think or to go away thinking that we are, that it's a genetic doom or genetic, genetically predisposed to something that we can't do anything about. So I want to come back to that and, and touch on that in, in a minute. But let's go, Jeff, let's talk about one of the issues here that um, was very controversial early on when I first started covering um, bariatric surgery, the thought of doing that for uh, adolescents was you know, really considered very uh, controversial or, or taboo. Uh, but tell me what the, what the current thinking on that is. It, it, it might actually be um, a reasonable approach to uh, obesity control in some kids? It, it's evolved quite a bit, Max. Um, the, the early work that you're allu alluding to uh, goes back as far as 2010, where surveys showed that 50% of pediatricians and family practitioners would not even consider referring uh, a child under the age of 18 for bariatric surgery. Uh, and despite evidence coming out from uh, well-controlled multi-center studies um, run by you know, very, very uh, competent, capable, careful people, um, even as, as late as 2016, there still was the same number who would not be referring patients. Um, it really wasn't until we started to get bigger numbers and support from some of the national organizations, the American Society for Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery, and then a year later, an actual uh, position statement from the American Academy of Pediatrics. Um, and their position evolved from early on, I believe 2013, that surgery should be considered to then recommending that surgery was appropriate for patients with severe obesity. So, uh, so we've made some positive headway in that regard. And I just so wanted to add, is, oh, yes, please. I was just going to add, um, there is limited long-term outcomes, but there was a, a publication from the teen lab study and we do have five-year outcomes. Um, and this particular study had a 96% follow-up rate, which was really excellent. Um, and they had a mean percent weight loss of 26%. And what they did find for complications and comorbidities of obesity was that 68% of these children actually normalized their blood pressure. 81% um, normalized their triglycerides. And 86% of type two diabetes patients actually remained in remission. So certainly there are patients that would benefit from this particular intervention, in addition, of course, to diet and lifestyle and the medications that we have available, but it is an adjunct therapy that can be utilized for certain patients. And I think they're still figuring out which patients might benefit most from that, um, but the, the, the data that is there is very promising. I, I would just add that um, there is data from uh, the largest series in the world um, done outside the United States that goes out to 10 years and it shows similar sorts of numbers that um, it, it lasts. Did you mention blood sugar as well, or was that part of that study? The one I mentioned, yes, the type 2 diabetes, certainly that 86% of those patients remained in remission five years after surgery. Hey, Jeff, I think part of the issue, uh, as you uh, alluded to, of course, is uh, referral and getting primarily, I guess, pediatricians to refer um, kids who are severely uh, obese for this, but there's also the issue of payment, uh, of reimbursement. Uh, have the insurance companies come around to, uh, uh, to thinking that this is okay uh, as an intervention? Uh, interestingly enough, um, more of the Medicaid managed care plans have um, come around um, compared to some of the private payers. Um, I'm not a part of those discussions, so I don't know why that is. Um, some of it may have to do with the population uh, whose insurance is Medicaid managed care. Um, but there is an understanding, there, there was some sense that um, by not 
providing surgery and knowing that many people will change their insurance carrier over time, that you mm -hmm. could just kick the problem down the road and somebody else would ultimately have to pay for it. Right. When you do cost analyses of treating children who have metabolic problems such as diabetes and so on, treating them early and allowing them to achieve remission, your long-term expenses go down dramatically and it balances out at about four years and then it starts to save money. So insurance companies largely have come around, but they still um, put up a lot of hurdles that we have to jump over in order to get somebody approved. Interesting, interesting. I, I think an important thing to be aware of in this context is the ongoing debate about whether there's anything special with regard to surgery beyond its effects on body weight. There is a lot of literature suggesting that there may be other benefits, but I think it is important, at least in this context, to remember that what really is being achieved is enduring weight loss. That's what's not achievable generally under most medical interventions. And it's why surgery has become a reasonable expedient in the present era. But it's also important to remember that its predominant effect is to produce enduring weight loss. And we know that even modest hmm. amounts of weight loss will reverse many of the phenotypes or metabolic complications of obesity, such as diabetes, hypertension, and dyslipidemia. It doesn't take surgery to do that. It takes enduring weight loss. And the important, hmm. the important item contributed by surgery is primarily enduring weight loss. If we knew how to do that by other means, it might not be necessary to use surgery as an expedient. But I think as Jeff is pointing out, it now is a reasonable, safe, and effective long-term alternative to repeated bouts of dieting that don't necessarily have long-term impact on the risks that are associated with obesity in children and adults. One of the misconceptions I think about children is that somehow they can endure obesity from a metabolic perspective better than an adult can, and they won't get hypertension or dyslipidemia or diabetes. It's absolutely not the case. They show the same metabolic stigmata of obesity as, as adults do, and they show the same types of responses to modest degrees of weight loss. So I think it's very important that practitioners or physicians who see children realize this. They're not, they're not immune from the effects of this mm. disorder in terms of its short and long-term consequences for health. I, I think it's, it's essential, particularly for, for this audience, to understand that surgery has a role to play, but surgery doesn't make you lose weight. Mm -hmm. Surgery makes it easier to change your eating behavior than anything else. And ultimately, it's the change in eating behavior um, coupled with increasing exercise, which, of course, becomes easier to do when you don't weigh as much, right. that results in weight loss and more enduring weight loss. But if there's no change in eating behavior, well, in our program, people don't qualify for surgery. We have to, we have to see that they've been able to make changes that they have changes that are not what we want, but what they can do that are sustainable. And then and only then do they become candidates for surgery. And then they need coaching afterwards to mm -hmm. keep that goal in front of them. Jane, I saw you nodding your head and, and wanting to jump in. Tell me. No, I just recently, this is making me think of a patient I just recently saw. She's 16. She, she's been, she's had an elevated BMI her entire life. I saw her um, after two years and she, in the past two years, she's gained another 50, almost 60 pounds, oh, extremely my. tearful. And um, she said, you know, I, I know what to do. You've been telling me, you know, diet and exercise my whole life. And, and I just know it won't work. I would, and she was seeking a bariatric surgery referral. And while my, my knee jerk response was, you know, let's, let's work with you a little longer. Let's, you know, let's revisit, you know, some of the um, counseling that we've done for years. Um, 
as a team, we thought, you know what, she, I think she should talk to the bariatric team. So I did refer her to Dr. Sansani's group. Um, and um, she also just had tremendous relief because she thought I was going to put up all these roadblocks for her to get to the bariatric team. And so there are psychological benefits as well. Um, she may or may not, you know, end up being a candidate or follow through, but she was uh, tremendously grateful that we did not hold up her bariatric referral. John, can I, um, can I jump in here and just, sorry, I, I just wanted to say that, and we were talking about um, and differences in, in adults versus pediatrics. We've actually seen a dramatic increase in type two diabetes since the pandemic. Um, and, and what we know about diabetes and others can speak better than, than I can about this, but what we know about type two diabetes in children is it's a bad disease. It's worse than diabetes in, in adults. Um, so these, these are kids who really do need treatment. This is not something uh, that we can, can sit and watch uh, for a long time. These, uh, this increase in diabetes, I think, particularly among the patients that I see has been really disheartening. Um, and there, and, and I, don't, I can't completely um, explain it. Is that because they will be exposed to the problems of um, high uh, glucose for so many more years if, it, if they're not treated early on? Well, I can say they're more brittle in general, that they tend to need to go to insulin quicker than, than adults. Um, so I'm not sure if it, you know, I, again, I'm not the perfect person to speak about this, but it's, uh, it's I think their, pan their, 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 their pancreas just doesn't work as well. And hmm. they've kind of burnt it down quicker than, than the adults, but I can let someone else. Yeah, there's been a misperception. Again, I alluded to this a little bit earlier on that children somehow get a pass on the consequences of obesity with regard to metabolism until they reach adulthood and then the clock starts. And that is a misperception. The clock starts at the time that they become obese. And as was just mentioned, some of the consequences are actually accelerated in children rather than being delayed. And certainly type two diabetes is one of the metabolic consequences that we're seeing more and more often in these children um, as a result of the accelerating degrees and rates of obesity. And there's another factor that's probably playing into this, which is the consequence of being incubated in the environment of an obese mother. In other words, it's now starting to look like if you are gestated in the presence of a mother who herself is dysglycemic, this looks like it actually imposes stresses on the beta cells of the fetus and, the, and that that can increase the risk of becoming diabetic. All of the other issues that we're alluding to aside, genes or otherwise, exposure of a fetus to a high glycemic ambient is actually a predisposing factor for the development of obesity. So what we're seeing is actually a forward feed in the risk of obesity and diabetes because the population is getting more obese and more and more children are the product of obese gravitas. So this is another important point to remember. Maybe the most important being is you don't get a vacation from the metabolic consequences of obesity because you're little. Mm -hmm. Let Absolutely. Me add, uh, I oh, should have mentioned was... this early on. Hang on one second. Is that if you have a, a question and a couple of uh, our folks, our, our viewers here, are, were already smart enough to do it on their own, <clears throat> you can ask a question either in the Q&A uh, or you can uh, raise your hand. And as we get to them, I'll feed the questions out to, uh, uh, to, to our panelists. Uh, I just wanted to add to what um, Rudy had said. Obesity begins before conception. So it is really important to assess for things such as uh, parental obesity. Um, if there is one parent that has obesity, uh, this leads to a, a three-fold increased risk of obesity into adulthood. And if there are two parents with obesity, this leads to a tenfold risk of um, obesity into adulthood. Mm -hmm. So certainly um, assessing that piece, assessing for uh, gestational diabetes, as Rudy had stated, is very key. Um, assessing for children if they're large for gestational age or if they're born small for gestational age, those are things that also lead to an increased risk of obesity into adulthood. So certainly all of those things are, are major uh, factors to take into account. 
I think on top of what Rudy said, I think of this in a very simple terms, and that's that when you think about the diseases, the metabolic diseases associated with obesity, diabetes, insulin resistance, high cholesterol, uh, metabolic syndrome, infertility issues, these are issues that in my generation happened to my grandparents, not to my peers. And obesity accelerates the aging process. So now you don't have to be 65 to have these problems. You can be 12. Mm. And so increasing, you're, you're just accelerating the aging process further and further so that for sure, by the time you get to your 20s, your 30s, you will have had a disease process that's ongoing, ongoing for a longer period of time and likely to have a negative impact on your long-term survival. So Jane, it sounds like we really need to start with some sort of family-based intervention. It's not enough to have uh, to talk to the child. You really have to uh, make it a broader intervention than that. Absolutely. Um, when you're working with children and adolescents who are overweight, um, involving the family is really key. And I, research does show that higher weight adolescents are more successful in achieving healthy weight loss when there's close family support and when the focus is on lifestyle modifications for the whole family. Um, we occasionally will have parents say, well, I have a skinny kid and I need to you know, have this full fat milk for this kid or we like soda. And we, so we, we, always, we always say we should not be singling out um, one family member, this is, these are changes for the whole family. Um, we tell our parents that they're the role models um, for healthy eating, but also physical activity, um, screen time use. You know, we tell our kids to be off the phone, but their phones, but they sh we should be off them as well. Um, and they're the ones who also are um, controlling the food environment in the house. So if you don't have the family buy-in, it's really um, difficult to implement these changes. So especially, particularly in younger children, the parents are the ones who are um, buying the groceries and preparing the meals. Um, so we recommend things like frequent family meals, um, which we know can be uh, protective against obesity and um, eating disorders. Um, cooking together when possible, and also getting back to what John was talking about, weight stigma. Weight stigma can also happen in the home, and we sometimes hear it in the office where a family will call out their kid, and so we just um, educate them on um, not, not, not speaking um, in that manner to their child, and because there can be real negative consequences to that. Uh, so let me put this out to the to the entire panel then, because I think what would be useful to our community pediatricians is what's our decision making algorithm here, if you will. Where do we start? What do we start with? And do we end up with, for example, uh, some obesity medications that might be useful in kids, or end up uh, uh, with Jeff uh, for bariatric surgery? What's, what's the process here that, that uh, a pediatrician should recommend uh, to parents and families then? Marissa, uh, I mean, you buy that? I, uh, oh. I think John, John was gonna stalk. Okay. Sorry, sorry. Um, so, you know, there is the AAP is going to come out with new guidelines this year. Uh, it's been a, you know, I was a member of the American Academy of Pediatrics Section on Obesity Executive Committee for a while, and these have been in the works. So they're coming out. So one part of that answer is stay tuned. Um, but mm -hmm. you know, I think part of, of the answer is you, you, you start with regular dietary counseling, we call prevention, prevention plus, giving these kind of messages. Um, and then when that doesn't work, you can add a nutritionist. And if a nutritionist by, by his or herself is not working, then you can talk about intensive behavioral interventions. Um, and really when I say intensive behavioral inter interventions, I mean intensive. The United States Preventative Task Force did a meta-analysis of all of these and found that the one thing that was common in all the successful interventions was you required 26 contact hours over six months. So that's a lot. And mm -hmm. we're talking about a, a multidisciplinary team. We're talking about a, some kind of doctor, a nutritionist, an exercise person, whether it be a physiologist or a physical therapist, and someone to deal with the mental health issues. And just on this note, you know, this is um, a grade D recommendations from the United States Preventative Task Force. So this is supposed to be covered by all insurances. 
can tell you this is not the case, um, but something to advocate for. Uh, but there is success. And actually, the, the programs that had the most success actually doubled that time to 52 intervention hours. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about some pretty increased interventions. And if you are then failing that, then you're talking about going for bariatric surgery. And particularly a lot of those kids with severe obesity, they're not going to be able to decrease their weight enough. Um, so they might need medications and they may need bariatric surgery. And, and we know that many of them actually will. Mm -hmm. Marissa, we have a couple of questions about medications like the GLP-1 uh, medications. Are, are any of these medications uh, suitable or appropriate for children? Great. So that's a really great question. So of course, primary, just as John had mentioned, it's diet and lifestyle interventions. Um, but pharmacotherapy does play a role. So in regards to the pharmacotherapy options that are available for children, our options are very limited. In fact, prior to the year 2020, there was only one FDA approved medication for the treatment of obesity. And that was Orlistat, which is um, an enteric lipase inhibitor. However, in the last 18 months, there have been two new FDA approved medications for the treatment of obesity, which is very exciting. Um, so in regards to Orlistat, that it is an enteric lipase inhibitor. It's been approved for several years. Um, and that medication uh, prevents the breakdown and absorption of fat. That is FDA approved for children 12 years of age or older. However, it is very limited in use in clinical practice because of the side effects. So it does cause significant abdominal distress, flatulence, diarrhea, oily stools. Um, and so that's very limited in clinical practice. There is a medication called fentramine. Uh, which is a sapathomimetic amine that is used uh, and works on the central nervous system to control appetite. Um, however, that medication is not recommended for use in pediatric patients um, 16 years of age or younger. It's only FDA approved for obesity in older than 16 years of age. Um, and then of course we have metformin, which I'm sure many people are familiar with. So that is an insulin sensitizer. Uh, so essentially that is commonly used in children and adolescents, but it is only FDA approved for children and adolescents over the age of 10 with type two diabetes. Um, but there have been multiple trials that have shown a small amount of weight loss with its use, particularly in the first few months of initiation. However, we always talk about the side effects with families. So that also causes um, abdominal side effects. Certainly you can have nausea, you can have diarrhea um, and lab work is followed closely. So um, we usually give that medication with meals to minimize the side effects. Uh, that medication is utilized by endocrinologists and obesity medicine specialists for polycystic ovary syndrome and severe insulin resistance with or without impaired glucose tolerance because of um, the, the plan or the, the goal is to prevent the progression to type two diabetes. So that's, that's why that medication is utilized. Now, in regards to the newer medications that were approved, um, GLP-1 agonist actually was um, FDA approved originally in 2019 for the treatment of type two diabetes in children 10 years of age or older, but it was recently FDA approved in 2020 for the uh, treatment of obesity in 12 to 17 year olds, which is very exciting. So essentially that medication affects glucose control through several mechanisms. It leads to an advancement, um, an enhancement of glucose uh, dependent insulin secretion. It slows or delays gastric emptying. Um, and it also causes a reduction of postprandial glucagon and also food intake. So essentially all of these mechanisms work together in order to maximize nutrient absorption um, and to um, limit weight gain. Uh, again, when we're discussing that injectable medication with families, there are significant abdominal side effects, again, um, mm -hmm. particularly abdominal pain, nausea, there can be um, the side effect of pancreatitis. So whenever we're choosing a medication with families, we do counsel them on the side effects and the mechanisms in action. And we really decide which medication is best for each individual patient. And then finally, there was a medication called setmelanotide, which was um, FDA approved in November, 2020. Now that is a, a melanocotton-4 uh, agonist and that was developed for the treatment of obesity. Now that medication is FDA approved for patients who are six years of age, or mm. older with obesity due to three rare genetic uh, mm -hmm. mutations, POMC deficiency, PCSK1 deficiency, and LEPR deficiency. Um, and what's exciting is that medication is currently undergoing clinical trials for additional rare 
genetic disorders such as Alstrom syndrome and Bardet-Bidal, and that's an injectable medication as well. So hopefully that can be expanded to include additional patients who'll be able to um, reap the benefits of that medication. So certainly when we're deciding what's best for patients, um, the most important thing is prescribing these medications in a multidisciplinary team, of course. You know, I have my patients meet with my nutritionist and they meet with my behavioral specialist, and it really is a team approach to be the most successful. Um, and then medications, of course, I discuss with families, it's a tool for our weight uh, to get to our, our healthy weight goal, um, right. but it is in conjunction with the other diet and lifestyle modifications. Well, you sort of teed it up there a, a little bit for something that Jeff mentioned uh, kind of in passing that I want to make sure uh, we're clear on, and that is uh, the vital ingredient to make sure even something as what some people would consider as, as a drastic an intervention as bariatric surgery is that uh, behavior change and some sort of behavioral intervention is really critical for the success of bariatric surgery, is that fair? Oh, absolutely. I, I think that um, if you look at 100 patients who have had bariatric surgery, um, the majority of them who have been through a, a multidisciplinary program, um, such as, as we have it at Cornell and at our institution and other places around the country, um, they have a very good chance of doing well, but not everybody who has the same exact operation is going to do well. So it's it's not like taking out the appendix where the appendix is gone, so you're not going to get appendicitis anymore. It ha it's a component in the treatment. And without the behavioral component, plus or minus medication, um, patients are, are at risk for not doing well. Yeah, I tell people you can out eat any operation, no matter no matter what what we what you do. And in terms of behavioral change, someone here asks, we should probably stop admiring chubby cheeks in uh, in, in babies. That uh, that just sort of reinforces the idea that uh, a fat kid or a fat baby is is uh, is healthy and cute. I suppose. Um, let's talk, uh, Jane. There was a question here um, about. Uh, the pandemic itself being a component with or without, even without weight gain, uh, that the pandemic itself may be contributing to the increase in, in diabetes in children? I can only imagine the pandemic, all the factors that we discussed earlier leading to the weight gain that we've seen, and then the weight gain is, um, what we're, you know, is what is driving the increase in the diabetes that we're seeing. Um, in the so it's hard, it's hard to separate these things. I think so. Mm, okay. I don't know if you would agree, Marissa. I agree. <laughs> One of the related issues, though, is the question of whether the virus itself can assault the beta cell in a way that could compromise it acutely, which definitely acute problems with the beta cell characterize severe infections with COVID, whether it's due to the actual access of the virus to the beta cells or due to the metabolic consequences of a severe infection altogether remains unclear. But one question that's not been fully resolved is if the virus does have access to beta cells, could it impair function over time in such a way as to make individuals who might otherwise be susceptible to developing type 2 diabetes for genetic or environmental reasons such as we discussed, might it accelerate the onset of the disease so that they will develop the disease earlier than they other, otherwise might have, make them more susceptible to their own obesity, a variety of other considerations that remain unsolved, but this is a very important and critical question. There's a huge population of individuals who have been exposed to this virus in a way that's caused significant illness. We don't really know on an epidemiologic basis what the consequence of that contact with this virus is. This remains to be seen, but it's almost certain that it's not going to improve the risk of becoming diabetic. So I think we have to anticipate that it's very likely that at least in some individuals, it will, it will accelerate the rates of onset of diabetes 
due to their own susceptibility to their underlying obesity or other predisposing factors. This so Rudy, as, as you mentioned, it's clear that um, uh, the genetic issues here are really uh, varied and, and, and work at a lot of different uh, levels uh, in, in our physiology. Uh, one that I, uh, I've heard discussed uh, interestingly is the microbiome. And by changing, there have been, I guess, some cases where you've changed the composition of the microbiome from a a, a skinny person and put it into a, an, an overweight person and, and they, they suddenly lost weight. Uh, how, are, is this genetic? Uh, are these genetic issues? How does that play into all of this? The, the role of the microbiome, in this case, meaning the flora in the colon of individuals right. with regard to body weight regulation, I would say, at least in humans, remains a, a unclear with regard to what role, if any, the microbiome plays in the regulation of body weight in humans. There have been a variety of experiments done in mice to which you alluded, where human feces have been moved into mice and vice versa, showing what look like effects on body weight, but I think in the aggregate, it is not clear what these organisms are doing with regard to body weight regulation in humans. I'll just make two points. One possibility is that somehow they are secreting molecules into the circulation that do affect the brain regulation of ingestive behaviors, food intake. Again, it's not clear that that's actually happening. Another possibility is that they are contributing to the efficiency with which food or calories that reach the colon are actually being restored to the circulation. And a very small improvement in this sense, in terms of the efficiency of absorption of calories, might contribute actually to weight gain or defense against weight gain. These, the differences here though are so small as to be very difficult to detect in sort of standard kinds of clinical experiments. It would take very careful measurement of these factors in a clinical research center setting to decide these things. So I think for the time being, the safest position of physicians is to say, this remains to be seen. It certainly, I think, is not an indication for moving uh, microorganisms from one person's colon to another at this point. But okay. they, they may play a subtle role a la some of the mechanisms that I mentioned. Interesting. Let me, let me put a question out here to the whole panel uh, and see who, who has something because there, there are a couple of questions that have come in and they're kind of, it's kind of the elephant in the room in that, John, you mentioned the recommendation of uh, as much as I believe you said, what, 52 hours of face-to-face uh, -face intervention. Um, and given that so much of the obesity issues uh, are part of are, are socioeconomic issues as well, how are we going to get some kind of reimbursement to actually implement the kinds of interventions that, that we need or we're talking about here uh, to help control this, this epidemic? If, if it's not getting paid for, it's not gonna get done. That's, that's, that's a million dollar question. If I could answer that, I'd be, I'd be in a really good place right now. But I think a lot of our kids in the US are covered uh, by, by Medicaid and, and Medicaid is, if you've seen uh, what, what some of my colleagues say, if you've seen one Medicaid program, you've seen one Medicaid program. They're all different. And, and some of my colleagues in different states across the country have gotten different programs to pay for um, some of the, these interventions. So I think part of it is being, being good advocates and getting our, our programs to start paying for it. And then some of the private insurers, I think, will, will continue on. Uh, there's a bill, Treat Obesity Seriously Act, that if we passed in, in the Senate and Congress right now would go a long way to getting some of this paid for. And I think we need to be, we need to develop medications and we need to develop uh, cheaper ways in order to give this program. And I think telehealth has made a huge uh, inroads and we're, we're doing a lot of telehealth now, which is a lot more convenient for families um, and, and, you know, ex expanding access to, to patients. So 
um, there, and, and I think we need to keep going with these medications. So it's a many, a multifaceted approach, I think. Thoughts from the rest of our panel here on how we can make this happen? Marissa, I saw you nodding your head. Yeah, so I think really programs that are promoting <laughs> nutrition, education, lifestyle resources for families are vital during this intersection between the COVID-19 pandemic and the obesity epidemic. Um, I know in my practice, we have converted our weight program from in-person to virtual in order to continue to provide group nutrition education opportunities and physical activity opportunities to families. So we engage families in cooking and physical activity demonstrations. We review label reading and re restaurant dining, supermarket shopping, um, just really engaging families. And really the key is family support. As Jane had mentioned earlier, um, we want parents to be supportive of implementing these dietary changes, but also implementing these changes for the entire family. So I think that those are really key pieces, just something. And as pediatricians, we are really um, particularly well positioned to provide diet and nutrition and um, education to our families. But I also think it goes beyond just us. It also goes at the level of the government too and having national health policies, especially during this time to really help in um, increasing support for healthy foods and increasing support for more physical op activity opportunities for children. Um, and also being sure that we can provide um, healthcare access to uh, families that are in need because ultimately mm -hmm we really wanna help keep our children in school, um, that will help to support their physical and their emotional well-being overall. So I think there's a lot of different aspects um, that can really help in uh, tackling this, this obesity epidemic. So I see that we're uh, running close to the end of our uh, hour for our webinar here. And I've asked uh, our panelists, or I forewarned our panelists that I'd like to uh, hear a, um, a pearl of wisdom, a little take home nugget uh, that we would like our, our viewers uh, uh, to remember and to take home from, from our webinar today. And um, Jeff, if I may, let, let's start with you. What, what would you like people to remember about what we've been talking about tonight? Well, I, I was just going to say on, on top of what uh, we were just talking about, um, that I think the, the blue whale in the room, which of course is the largest mammal, is that um, we have to prevent obesity. And that, that starts at a governmental level. It's fighting um, <laughs> the whole um, capital budget um, and everything else and, and industries who survive based on that. Um, that's, that's another year's worth of seminars. Um, but as a surgeon, I think that um, the one thing I would, I would hope people understand is that Surgery absolutely has a role, but it only has a role in patients who, who appropriately understand um, what's necessary to do in order to get the benefit from surgery. Um, we don't sell operations. We try to help people change their lifestyles, and that's what surgery can sustain, but they have to be able to make those changes, and we try to coach them through doing that. Fair enough, fair enough. Jane, what can you tell us? I guess my um, thought would be to um, redefine what success is. Of course, we want our patients to lose weight and to improve their cardiometabolic um, risk factors, but also um, as pediatricians, we um, need to screen for um, mental health disorders, which are contributing to do, um, the obesity problem and um, food insecure, address food insecurity, which is contributing. So, thinking about it as a multifactorial and um, it could be a win if you connect your family to resources in the community, whether it be mental mm -hmm. health, food, um, food sources, um, and getting the whole family on board. So it's not just about seeing um, the weight go down when you see them back. Got it. Rudy, what can you tell us uh, about what you've been talking about, uh, that genetics, I guess, is not uh, destiny in this case? I, I think an important 
message, although we haven't discussed this, it's been implied by many of the comments here is that body weight and adiposity is a regulated physiological variable in the same way that height and um, eye color and hair color and uh, blood pressure are regulated. And we must not treat patients who have a problem with regard to body weight as if this was somehow a um, an aspect of their physiology, which is unlike almost any other, totally in their control. Like be like telling them, oh, you could regulate your own blood sugar or serum sodium or BUN by thinking your way out of the problem or behaving your way out of the problem. This is a regulated aspect of individuals' physiology. And when we ask a patient or a child to lose weight in service of their health, this is not a trivial request. So I think I would emphasize, A, this is a biological phenotype. It is to a substantial degree regulated or controlled by genes, but there are many other factors that play into this. And that because it is regulated, we must honor the individuals in whom we are suggesting therapeutic intervention and the best way to intervene in this so-called epidemic is, as has been mentioned several times, is to prevent the obesity in the first place. But again, since it is a regulated aspect of physiology, this is a non-trivial enterprise. So what we need to do is ultimately prevent it. And the only way we're gonna do that is to better understand the biology and understand how to influence the environment, which we've talked about in several aspects in such a way as to make the prevalence of this problem go away. But there are always going to be individuals who stratify within a community that are heavier than others. It's baked into our biology and we, we're not going to be able to make this go away by any single either environmental or medical or other uh, intervention. Well said. Uh, Marissa, what can you add here that uh, people can take home? Sure. So I just wanted to end by saying it's really important for pediatricians when they're approaching families to assess that medical risk of the individual um, because it is vital for us to screen for these complications that can develop. We know that these children are at greater risk for insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome and dyslipidemia uh, and elevated blood pressure. And we know that children with obesity are at greater risk of becoming adults with obesity, with associated health problems such as type two diabetes and ischemic heart disease and stroke. And we do know that children who have a BMI greater than the 95th percentile have a greater chance of maintaining that obesity into adulthood. So we ultimately as pediatricians, we serve as advocates for the future health of our patients. So if we can intervene early on and uh, provide these children uh, with, with, with the tools they need to prevent these complications, then we're helping to give these children a healthy future. Well said, well said. John, as the uh, director of the Pediatric Obesity Initiative, you get the last word. Well, I, um, I see that NAFLD was not mentioned. NAFLD is a big problem. Uh, I'll just throw that out there as, as a comment, but I agree with what everyone, what everyone is saying. I think Obesity is a disease. It's a it's a um, a long-standing disease, and it's not something that's going to be cured just by weight loss. You're going to have these set metabolic adaptations, um, and I think parents need to know that that these are lifelong changes we're talking about. Whether it's an adjuvant of therapy or medication, these are things that potentially children are going to have to take throughout the rest of their lives in order to maintain this weight loss. Um, and it, just to to kind of know that um, so that they don't go go in thinking that again it's something that can be easily changed. It's a a long lasting illness that's gonna be with them through life, um, but that we do have more and more treatments um, and more and more things we can offer our patients. Well said. I wanna thank all of our panelists for uh, what I think has been a very informative uh, and interesting panel that uh, I think all of our viewers uh, can take home a lot of uh, nuggets here, if you will, uh, of, of ways to deal with this. And we, we clearly have made the point that this is a uh, multifaceted issue that no 
not one size will not fit all. Uh, we need to attack it from a lot of different directions, uh, uh, family interventions, uh, uh, paying for it uh, as well. So uh, we've got a lot, we still have a lot of work to do here to have uh, some sort of an impact. Don't forget this will be available on the uh, Columbia Children's Health YouTube channel, as well as the Wild Cornell Health uh, Initiative uh, and their uh, channel as well. And there will be a summary document. Several people have asked uh, here for the names of some of the medications that were uh, discussed uh, earlier, and that will be uh, presumably in our summary document. Again, thank you to our panelists. We hope you got something uh, important. And, you know, it's been almost two and a half years now, but over two years. And I can't believe that I still have to say, wear a mask and get vaccinated, please. Have a great night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.